How many of you have listened to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast? I can't tell you that react how much that means to us. Yeah. Welcome back to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Brandon. Join us as we wrestle with what it takes to transform ourselves and the businesses we lead. This new camera angle makes my arms look smaller than yours. I'm noticing that and I really appreciate it. I thought you did that on purpose. No, I, I don't. I didn't. And I, I am not happy with it. Okay. Welcome to the show. I'm Chris. We got Brandon over here. Hello. Hello. Um, Are we still sound checking? Hello? No. No. We're, we're in. This is live. Okay. Oh, come on. Knock it off. You're misbehaving. Um, hey, for those of you that are new uh, to the Head, Heart, Boots podcast, a uh, li- little bit of background. Um, you know, Brandon and I are the founders of Floodlight Consulting Group. And Head, Heart, and Boots is really a fashion project of Floodlight. Uh, for those of you, for the uninitiated, um, Floodlight is a full service consulting company. Um, we work with restorers all over the country. Um, our book of clients represents almost a quarter billion dollars worth of revenue across the industry around the United States. And our team uh, provides support, advising, coaching um, to these companies to help them grow, help them become more profitable and ultimately build an exit ready business. So if that's you, uh, floodlightgrp.com, certainly check us out, look us up, kick the tires, uh, take our health and value assessment. Um, at floodlightgrp.com forward slash audit. All right. Yeah, man. Yeah. Here we go. Love it. Yeah. So fun combo today. Um, you know, I think I think one of the things that's fun about our role with the podcast, we just get to make friends with some really rad influential people, people that have the opportunity to help uh business owners uh increase, you know, every the win, the successes. And JT's one of them. JT's broker. He he helps represent businesses when it's time to put together a, uh, a deal and, and exit. He's done a billion dollars is that what of transactions in the last uh, however many years Busy. he's been operating. Yeah, Billions. incredible. Dude, yep. that's a crazy number. That's a big that? number. That's kind of fun. Yeah. So anyways, long story short, the guy knows what he's talking about. Yep. Um, and we just dig in, right? We're, we're, uh, we get into some core elements of this kind of this uh, planning and building an exit ready business. We don't get caught up on, I think, what everyone's talking about. Um, we were able to just kind of get into those maybe less obvious uh, elements of the conversation of the process of the planning. Um, and I think there's a real clear, uh, a line on, and an encouragement on start today, uh, doing what you want to end up, you know, feeling the results of later, you know? And for those of us that are really antsy and, uh, you know, follow the shiny objects, it's like, okay, what, what, tell me what to do. What can I do? There's, there's even a couple nuggets in there. That's like, go do this. Uh, we get into overhead costs. Yeah. Managing overhead costs, costs of goods, yeah. inflation, right? What do you do about it? There's a couple of nuggets in in this uh, show that I think yeah. uh, people will find really useful and valuable. Yeah. Um, and hopefully a little bit different angle on the whole buying, selling businesses, the M&A, the PE thing that uh, hasn't been talked about ad nauseum in yeah. the public sphere. So Exactly. Yeah. All right. I love Good it. Time. Let's go. JT, sir. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh, before we hit record here, we had a little uh, life life chat. You are a busy man. You you keep finding yourself over here on the West Coast, which is kind of interesting. I do. I lived in Portland for 35 years. Uh, three and a half years ago, moved to the southwest corner of Utah, just outside of Zion's National Park, and back regularly uh, babysitting grandkids while our kids travel. So, it's, uh, it's, it's worth it. There's this little pocket up here in Oregon. I mean, you, we got a uh, Rosebrook, just a kind of a tight yeah. industry. Eugene Hicks is, is based out of Oregon, another stud and a guy helping a lot of businesses. And of course we're, we're kind of biased that we think Chris and I have some value to, to offer. We're up here. There is like a, a kind of a, a little group that kind of comes out of the Northwest. Yeah, here Jerry, got Jerry Edel, Jerry Edel for oh, years right. was like 15 minutes from my house, you know, that's right. a background in Portland with a family uh, service master business. So yeah, this that's is right. This is a uh, civic Northwest is kind of one of the epicenters of yeah. uh, the restoration industry. Yeah, and they say the Pacific Northwest will cause hair loss, but they can't prove a thing with <laughs> yeah, the three no, of us. No I tell you, yeah. just can't do it. Yeah, just turn the cameras off. We'll be fine. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. Well, dude, you know we're excited to have you on the show. I mean, for those that that don't know, you know we've we've admired and and respected you and your input in the industry for a long time. We were actually introduced to you 
the first time through Eugene, you and he have uh, yeah. professional history and, and he just admired you and spoke highly of you. And, and we have often uh, turned to you to just get some additional layer of insight on what's happening in terms of what businesses need to be considering regarding exit readiness and, and multiples and all the things surrounding uh, exiting your business or preparing to exit. And that's where we want to go with you today. You've been gracious enough to share your time. And, and so we just thought, hey, let's, let's get a dialogue going where we can start talking about some realities uh, of what's going on around us, maybe get outside of the feeding frenzy talk and some of the disappointment, I think, that that some of our uh, contractors have experienced this year, too, because they were probably at the bar and their friend told them they were going to make a bajillion dollars if they sold their business. And then some things have been changing uh, over the last 18 months. And so I think there's a lot of ground for us to cover and still be fresh. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for people to get in a perspective of your level of expertise and professionalism that's a call away. And so we want to be able to have a chance to highlight that as well. And I think just to frame the conversation just a little bit more, the there are going to be some people listening to this that are brand new to the industry. They're a couple of years in. They know they're not looking to sell. They're not getting ready for their exit anytime soon. But I think what we've talked about this ad nauseum, you know, you and me, JT, and as a team, we talk about this a lot, right? An exit ready business is a really healthy business. So, mm-hmm. so even if, if you're one of those newer restorers and you're just the very beginning of your heroic journey, um, li- listen up because the the stuff that we're inevitably going to talk about right. it is the stuff that is going to create a really profitable business, profitable, like really uh, high cash flow, like all the things that you want in a company, whether or not you sell, next week, next month, or 10 years from now. Yeah. Um, so, that, And if that's you're a leader and you don't own the business, listen up, because these are the things that if you execute well on, uh, you're creating a ton of return on investment in your position. Huge value, opportunity. And, yeah, 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 and that creates the upside. So anyways, yeah. JT, right. we're going to shut up now. Uh, give us a quick, give us the quick background. There's probably a few people listening that don't know who you are. Um, so just really quickly, like primary focus, who you specifically work with, and then we're going to launch into some really good Q&A with you, my friend. Oh, quick background. Okay. I own three companies in the 90s, and uh, so I'm sitting in, uh, I've sat in your shoes a lot over the years. Um, I've got a tremendous amount of empathy and understanding for the conversations that business owners have with themselves and with their spouses and what the road ahead looks like. And over the last 25 years as an advisor, 17 of which you've been in the restoration space, I've been able to sort of bring that experience and understanding to business owners. And what I ask of business owners, whether it's restoration or trade services, is it's all about an education for me. And I really want them to make intentional and purposeful decisions. And the first thing I ask is that they got to want answers. And I'm shocked at how many people don't want answers. They just sort of want to burn that bridge when they get there. And the thing I hear the most is I should have called you two or three years ago when I first thought about selling and there's no way to back up at that point. Yeah. So as long as business owners want answers and want to make a purposeful and intentional decisions, you know, uh, then we make a pretty good team. Love it. Love it. And, and you've got uh, the pedigree and the track record to, to prove it. Um, we've, we've been, uh, interacting with with quite a few folks that you've had a partnership with, you've helped them create the exit opportunity for their business and and uh, accolades, a lot of respect um, for you and and how you carry yourself, and hence why we want to continue to develop our relationship. So, mm. okay, my man. So I I think what, if you guys are cool with it, the place I want to kind of open with because I I literally had a conversation not that long ago that I actually felt really kind of guilty about, man, and that was. You know, two and a half years ago, two years ago, even the kind of multiples, the information that was being shared in terms of what business owners could consider a possibility has changed. And it changed what Mm -hmm. I feel like was very quickly. And so I literally was having a conversation with a relationship and and we were going we were both very disappointed because what he and I had been talking about two years prior was not being reflected any longer in the current conversation. And he was very frustrated. And I understand Mm -hmm. his frustration. Of course, I'm kind of heartbroken because I feel like I was sharing information at the time that was valid. And now I feel like that information has changed. Long and short of it, 
sales are down this year in general for a lot of teams. Mm -hmm. Multiples are changing. The dialogue is changing. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to talk about it from an assumptive posture. I want to talk to a guy that's experiencing it firsthand. What is going on, man? What are you seeing? What is happening? Is this right? Like, is this a, just an assumption or is this softening a reality for us right now? You're partially right. And I appreciate you bringing it up. I could take you through the complete sort of rise and fall of where multiples have been over the last seven, eight years. And we won't have time to do that. That's its own discussion. But in the day, we'll say six, seven, eight years ago, four, four and a half, five, those are great multiples. Okay, PE started entering the, the picture, started pushing those multiples, five and a half, six, six and a half, seven. And the industry strategics, the ATI, BMS, first on site, blue sky, you custom, they're right behind. Mm -hmm. Okay, but PE took the lead in pushing those multiples. Well, what's happened the last year is very interesting. Everybody sort of is expecting now to get five and a half, six, six and a half, seven, seven and a half, depending on the size of their business. Multiples still range between three and eight. It's rare to get eight. You've got to be a sizable player in the market. And I, and I mean sizable with adjusted EBITDA of over three, three and a half million to command those kind of multiples. What's happened the last 12 to 18 months is that two things. It's really twofold. The market is soft right now due to this mild winter. We had a polar freeze, which wasn't big enough last, you know, I guess in January, that was a three week period. It wasn't long enough to carry the winter, we'll say. Yeah. So numbers are down. So when you say sales are down, that is correct. That's that's 100% accurate. And you never want to sell on a down year, right? My job is to put sellers in the best light possible. So right now, there's a lot of owners who are waiting to get through 22 and get those numbers. I'm sorry, 24, get those numbers prop back up. Yeah. And then they're going to pull the trigger again. But it's been a little bit mild, even throughout this year. There's a few customers, a few clients that are up, but the norm is that they're stable or down. Yeah. Okay? Would you and say, that's just to kind yeah, of go ahead. here real quick, JT, you know, I was talking to a client yesterday that's very heavily uh, uh, focused on commercial, their business mm -hmm. is booming. So uh, is there, do you, have you experienced or seen a lot of the companies maybe that have a harder leaning towards commercial were, were more spared this year than not? Do you, do you see, was it more the residential heavy businesses that were impacted by this kind of downturn, if you will, in the, in the industry? Yeah. Perfect question. Um, let me answer it this way. I'm going to give you a perfectly useless you know, economical you answer here. Correct me here. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be terrible. Um, the, a lot of buyers want the bread and butter of residential. They, they want that to pay the bills. They want that to be the even keel in the business, but they love one foot in the sandbox of the large projects, the large losses, the, you know, cat work, maybe, maybe not that, that there's going to be travel for, but let's face it. It's exciting. It's high margin. It doesn't come around very often, but that is a high risk, high stakes game. Okay. Your AR, your labor, everything gets extended, you know, in, in this commercial large loss arena. So depending on where they play in commercial, um, it's it falls in the same bucket. If it's the normal day-to-day -day commercial, we'll say it's it hasn't been beat up too bad. Uh, now, we say that there's been two hurricanes in Florida. Francine landed, what, yesterday afternoon, I think. Yeah. Uh, we don't know the effects of that yet. Yeah. But I have several clients down there with mobile cat teams. You know, some of those work out really well and others do not. So it, it can be all over the board. Okay. Um, there's more and more people looking at the daily bread and butter of the residential than the high risk game of, of commercial, commercial, if that makes sense. Yeah. And there can be very stable commercial out there, but they realize that's uh, much more of a um, uh, highs and lows. And the game plan moving forward is to smooth out those highs and lows into something predictable. Interesting. It's so interesting. I, that was a little counterintuitive for me personally. Uh, we've had several conversations with PE firms. Some of them have a very specific avatar or profile that is literally like no commercial. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't care about it. Yeah. We're not going to consider it. And at first glance, I'm like, I do not understand that perspective, mm -hmm. but you spend enough time with them. They've spreadsheeted that thing, uh, you know, uh, 10 different ways and they understand they they doing a lot with with uh with anal business analytics to make that determination yeah. well and if you oh sorry guys if you put yourself in their shoes this is what they're going through 
they've got to sell that predictability and the cyclicality of it yeah. to an investment board. And when they can't do it, their default position is, guess we better rely on something that's more predictable. So they've got to sell it and it's difficult to sell. Go, go ahead, Chris. I didn't mean to cut well, you. Well, no, I was just going to say, I think in the midst of this conversation, we're really talking about a few different things, right? Like there's the, the weather related catastrophe losses, which often mm-hmm. is commercial hotels, schools, right. commercial buildings, et cetera, which big high dollar, big high margin, and also long AR collection periods and so forth. Mm-hmm. And the unpredictability too, of the cost of mobilization. Some of those right. opportunities don't come to fruition and you have these significant costs that are just sunk costs. So there's that whole cat travel hurricane type. That's of right. Potential. Then there's the local organic cultivating direct sales relationships with small hotel groups, local school districts, that kind of stuff. Probably different perception uh, from investors around that steady eddy, you know, mm-hmm. five, six, seven, eight thousand dollar average loss, you know, uh, numbers versus the big we go travel, we send crews out regionally right. for things. Um, because part of what we sell our clients on, and I think frankly, a lot of restorers are really interested in is the 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 fidelity, the um the sure deal of commercial relationships where we don't mm-hmm. have an intermediary, we don't have a referral partner uh potentially uh dictating that relationship or a TPA mm-hmm. some sort of uh, uh third party that's negotiating that relationship for us. We get to just create a relationship with that chief engineer. Yeah or that director of facilities. And so, yeah, I think it's a different monster. It's correct. A different, different yeah. things, but it's yeah. interesting though. I think often PE like investment bankers and so forth don't necessarily have enough domain experience to differentiate those two. Would you agree with mm-hmm. that? At least that is correct. Yeah. First pass. Ooh, they have a lot of commercial, yeah. right? They don't necessarily differentiate those two things. Yeah. It, large loss and some of the cat looks great on paper, but you get down to the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, I've had clients wait two and a half years for FEMA approval on a million six project. Oh, sure. Yep. Well, you got you got to float that yeah. for a year and a half or two and a half years. And that's not easy. Yeah. You know, a lot of companies are they're more than ready to settle to pull to get some of that cash back out of the deal. Yeah. And so it, that's why I say it's a high risk, high stakes game. You got to have the chops for it. But if you do, it can be very lucrative. It's, yeah. a, it's amazing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I think a good place to lean in, guys, is in JT. I'm just really excited to hear your perspective on it. So, okay, if this is true, then if we've seen some multiple softening, we we see some some pulling back. Uh, you know, we definitely know of people their number that 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 mm-hmm. has part of an LOI at this point is t- people are coming back to the table and saying, ah, not so fast. We're not going to be able to stick with that yeah. number, right? What do we do? Like. What are you seeing? What are some of the patterns? Um, and I think if 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 you're cool with it, I think one of the things that I would love to lean into is uh, wrong assumptions, right? Like normally as business owners, we think it's going to be this thing that's going to make all the difference. I think often we're wrong. Uh-huh. Um, so just leaning into that from your perspective um, and, and let's see where, where it takes us, you know? Well, and it's, I love the general broad question there. There's so many owners that think an LOI is about the number, about the total figure, and it's not. It's a great place to start. It it absolutely is. But but there's three key numbers to a deal. There's the enterprise value. That's what your company's worth. There's a pre-tax yield. That's the number that happens at the closing table with all the balance sheet adjustments, the cash, the, the AR, the AP, the liabilities, et cetera. And then once everybody's been paid, then there's a post-tax yield, what I call a walkaway number. When it's all said and done, what does that owner get to walk away with? Ultimately, that's the number that matters. Okay. So there's so much emphasis on this first number and very little on the last two. So this is where uh, an owner receiving some advice and an education on what matters Okay, and what I mean by that is those balance sheet adjustments, what matters to that ind- individual moving forward? Is it some rollover equity? Is it continue working for a bit after you sell? Or do you want to just stop and, and retire completely? And that's really not an option. The larger your company is, it, uh, these PE firms and the industry strategics, they need that owner to stay for a year or two or three. 
And uh, there's, there's sellers who don't want to do that. And that can be a very interesting conversation. It can be about the career paths for your, your key individuals. You know, that I've heard more than one owner say, listen, I'm a one horse show. I've taken it as far as I can go. I want to hitch my wagon to some big horses and really be able to bring this team places where I can't pull them. Very admirable. Okay. That's part of an, uh, an LOI discussion. Earnouts are part of an LOI discussion. Okay? I sold a company a um, year and a half ago, uh, nice size deal, just over 20 million. And um, because of the growth that happened, uh, he was losing patience with me a little bit, but because of the growth that happened, we got him an $11 million earnout on top of the 23, 24 million. So now it's a, you know, $35 million deal. Yeah. So there's a lot of discussions that can be had outside the number. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's eight or 10 other variables that are part of an LOI discussion and what may be important to the seller and their family. So what I'm hearing you say, and this is this is super interesting. I think I'm going to want to hang in this pocket a yeah. little bit. So so even if let's say we just come into it with a very uh, raw understanding, top line. Ultimately, there's mm -hmm. a bottom line. Most of the time, our multiples are being determined by our our bottom line number. But what you're saying is there's these other levers that an exiting owner could be prepared to pull on. That will, mm -hmm. even if the multiple is not what they want, because in general, this is just the multiple that's available right now in the market. Mm -hmm. There's these other earning potential earning levers that they could be keyed in on or getting some interest Correct. from a guy like you to prepare for. Tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, you hit over it at like 30,000 feet, but what, what yep. are we talking about here? When we, when we say earnouts. Give me an idea of some of the different types. Like how would this thing come together? How can I be prepared to even think about them and how to leverage them in my favor? Sure. We'll, we'll sort of shift gears into earnouts. There's um, in the owner world and earnout is kind of a dirty word, right? They, the, the owners want to recover the value of their business today. They don't want to recover the, the today's value a year or two from now. And that's not how I look at an earnout. The way I look at an earnout is if you're growing and if you hurt, hit these certain key metrics, let's take advantage of that and get some of that value back to the seller. Okay. Now, the buyer's perspective is listen, we're, we're buying a business that's growing. We expect it to grow. Why should some of that value be put back to the seller? Well, I mean, we're buying a growing business. Don't penalize us and take some of those profits because we wouldn't be buying it if it wasn't growing. So I see two sides of it. Sure. Now, an earnout, what it does from 30,000 feet is level the playing field. When there's these risks, and bar none, every business has risks. Some are cleaner than others. Some have client risk factors. Some have ownership factors. Some have uh, key employee factors. Some have cyclicality. Others, uh, there's any number of reasons why there may be risk, but an earnout levels the playing field. And if the business is what the owners say it is, and the trends are what they say it is, then earnout shouldn't scare anybody. The, the hiccups come in where the sellers can overpromise and they'll say, we're growing 25% a year, year over year. And this year we're going to land X hospital or X university or X corporation. We should be up 45% by the end of the year. Well, buyers listen to every bit of that. And when it comes down to negotiations, they'll say, great. You said you were going to grow 45% this year. Let's set an earn out at that cap. And if you hit those numbers, you get X. And you can imagine the sellers, whoa, 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 that's the kind of best case scenario. We, we don't want to just set it at 45%. What if we hit 20 or 25%? Well, now the whole conversation changes. Yeah. So the earnouts are a really tricky thing to navigate. Um, but at the end of the day, I want the value to be delivered today and future value to be delivered in the future. And that's how I, that's how I try to approach them because it's unfair to the seller to think anything else. So this is interesting. So one of the things that we've heard very commonly as a penalty recently, and I'm mm -hmm. kind of tooting our own horn a little bit here, but so when our clients um, are succeeding and then for whatever strategic reason, they determine they want to start some conversations with a PE or, or, mm -hmm. uh, or a strategic, um, there's this situation right now where people are making gains. Not It's, it's not us. They're executing. 
and sure. they're developing robust gains in their business, meaning they've yeah. most of the time increased their profit substantially. They've increased mm -hmm. top line based on the kinds of relationships they're pursuing, right? There's been this shift in personnel internally that's allowing people to be more optimally producing because they're in the right seat doing the right thing. There's all these benefits. And sure. ultimately, most of these owners right now are getting penalized because the there is no direct correlation to the past that mirrors their current performance, right? So it's mm -hmm. like there's this reality right now where we have people that are working very diligently to build their company the way that mm -hmm. they need to, to make it exit ready. And then they get excited and they start having these conversations and all that work and all the growth, they're trying to be discounted. Uh, because they can't roll backwards and say, did I do this consistently over the last three years? Mm -hmm. And so in a case like that, because that's not abnormal right now, yep. is it then, is that where part of the opportunity could potentially be where they could maybe get Correct. aggressive about negotiating something around the earnout because they know all the hard work they've put into that company is going to fucking continue to yield a result and they don't want to get robbed of the value of it, Right. Correct. Time, timing is everything. Let, let me give an example. I sold a business in the Bay Area in January, actually, nine months ago. And they were brought to me and another advisor had, had put them at 1.9 million. Okay. I put them at four. And we no sooner hit the market, they started growing. They picked up uh, a couple of, I won't name names, but they picked up a couple of nice corporations locally in the Bay Area. They, they picked up university, they picked up a hospital. And she kept saying, we're growing, we're growing. And I said, listen, you've put me on a timeline. I'm trying to get you out of here by X date. Mm. But I also need to maximize the value. One of those two has to break. Mm. I can't deliver on both. Okay, because we've only got three months of the, the new co 2.0 behind us. Yeah. No buyer's going to write you a check for three months of great history. Yeah. Okay. They're buying the history, but they're buying it for the future. They're buying it for what it can be. So I said, something's got to break. And I said, I have a question for you. If, if the growth is going to continue like you say it is, what if we pulled it from the market for nine months, let these numbers mature, and then go back to market this fall? And now this was fall of 23. Okay. Yeah. And... She said, we'll do it. We'll absolutely do it. And their attorney called me and said, what the hell are you thinking? No, no advisor tells their client to pull a business from the market. And I said, listen, I'm pretty sure there's millions added to this value if these numbers mature. And he said, okay, he, he let me have it. And he said, if you're so sure, and I said, I'm pretty am, but I, I am sure, but I'm banking on what she's telling me. And he, he said, she's telling you the truth. And I said, okay. October 1 came. This was March. Uh, she convinced me to go with uh, Q3 numbers. Um, I had multiple buyers lined up. And instead of turning down offers in the mid fives, we got an accepted offer at eight. And then it went to nine. And so we added million based on a six month delay and letting those numbers mature. And so if there's a key takeaway here, timing is everything. And the uh, not only for the trend of the business, but the potential upside. And that's where there can be this earn out that says, we've only got a short window of history. You're saying you can accomplish this and are currently accomplishing this. If that keeps up, we'll kick you an extra, you know, X number of millions. Yeah. And that's very common because had they been doing that number for five years, eight years, it would have been a very different conversation. A point. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So mentally, I, I like, I'm just kind of trying to experience this for, from my own seat. So not too long ago, we had some teams talking to us about valuation on our business. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because we're, we're not, no, we're not, we're not even in the market, not even kind of, sure. um, but it's amazing how fast your mind starts to think about some of these mm -hmm. numbers. And how I had to, okay, I'm just going to be super transparent here. Oh, careful. I, I know. I don't want to be, yeah. <laughs> I had to take a, a bit of a walk and get my mm -hmm. head dialed back in mm -hmm. because it was so easy for my mind. I, I feel like there's probably right. some ego talk here where it was so easy for me to begin to give in to the yeah. now, the easy road out, the whatever. Like I can mm -hmm. only imagine if you've been building your 
restoration business for the last 10, 15, 20 years, and you're finally putting up yeah. a hand and saying, I'm burnt, man. I'm ready mm-hmm. to get out of this, this gig. And you get caught in this frustrating conversation where it's like somebody's telling you, yeah, but for this, you could be done now. Mm-hmm. But if you want to hold on a little longer, I think there's more gas in the tank. I'm just thinking mentally how easy it is to give up. Mm-hmm. Like if you're getting in a serious conversation about multiples, people start to think about, oh, wow, that would be nice. I, you know, That's right. I would do here's where we're moving. And you start going into this process and owning a fucking business is hard. Growing, well, let's, let's face it. This is hard, right? That's right. Uh, business ownership is not for everybody. Yeah. And it gets awfully lonely around the water cooler. Mm-hmm. You know, at seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, you know, midnight when you're staring at the bedroom ceiling and there's no answers up there. Yeah. Okay? And who do you turn to? Yeah. That's why these peer groups have, have become popular. Yeah. Just give me someone to ask a question to, because as a business owner, you're supposed to have all the answers. Yeah. And when you don't, it's frustrating. And if business ownership were easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. And it's not easy, especially in this industry. Yeah. And so what I do, you touched on it. Um, you, for that conversation, Brandon, you became the pretty girl to dance. Yeah. yeah. That's the analogy, right? Someone's looking at you trying to figure out if, if they can ask you to dance. And ultimately, are you going to go home with them that night? Yeah. A little bit crude, but yeah. that's how the conversation starts. And it's amazing to me how many people get flattered by that. Yeah, I've had I mean, everybody's got analysts and and BDOs cold calling restoration companies the last three years. Every week I get four or five companies call me or email me and they'd say, oh, I I got a a note from this company or that PE firm or that industry strategic. They're interested. Yeah. And I said, well, they reached out to you and 400 other people this week. Yeah. And they don't believe me, but they're flattered that they're on the hook and that they were asked to be in this conversation. And then what's even more disturbing, they'll say, well, I sent them my financials and I sent them my tax returns. And I say, well, did you bother to sign an NDA? No, what's that? They'll say, like, we, we got to back up. Let's let's get the cart uh, in front of the horse. Uh, you know, let's get the horse in front of the cart again here. Uh, it's uh, they just want to charge down that road. And they'll say, oh, yeah, they're going to buy me. They were so interested. Like, well, they're talking to you and 300 other companies just like that. Yeah. So don't think that uh, you're going home at the end of the dance because they uh, asked you about your financials. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think that's a huge reminder. I was just kind of blown away. I did a little bit of an after action review because, again, we but no, we're just now getting off the launching pad. We're so excited yeah. about what we're building and the momentum the organization and the team has. But mentally, man, I was just kind of like blown away by by that experience. Yeah. And I, you know what? Yeah. You that terminology you used is of of you get flattered and that's exactly what happens that's right you get yeah. flattered you get caught up in it you start to think about it and it's just amazing how quick your mind mm-hmm. i think sees a, a path uh, uh, of least resistance and it's correct like, oh, that would be yeah. a whole hell of a lot easier than grinding this thing out for the next 20 yeah. years whatever the well yeah. that is so and, and i think too and we've had to as much as we can get caught up in that too we've had to remind our clients of the same thing when yeah. they start getting into a conversation with a strategic or a pe company or whatever mm-hmm. and they start to they start to do the napkin math and it's like oh my god that's right well, well for for every one of you know every every 10 of those conversations five six seven eight nine of them end up the numbers look dramatically different when they actually come to the altar, right? Mm -hmm. They actually get into the due diligence uh, because of course these, these bankers and these PE companies, they're not stupid. Right. Mm -hmm. And they start putting the fine tooth comb over everything, right. Putting the magnifying glass on Mm -hmm. customer relationships, you know, past financials, right. The makeup of the team turnover, right. The leadership depth in the company and all this Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And now all of a sudden their number looks a little bit different that they're willing to try right. right and that's right could could you could you talk a little bit about that like because because there is like you said there's the loi but then following a letter of intent that's when all that due diligence starts to open up am i right that's right that's and correct what what are some of the hot buttons that start to <laughs> erode value mm, yeah. when that banker p company uh perspective owner or buyer yeah. to look at things that really tend to pop up. 
Yeah, it's a perfect question, and it's a loaded one, uh, yeah. Chris. Let me frame it a little bit. Um, buyers in general, the the negotiation phase of the LOI, there can be IOIs, indication of interest, uh, MOUs, uh, memorandums of understanding. It goes by a lot of different things, depending on how detailed the buyer wants to get. But some of it's not their fault. And what I mean is pre-LOI, it's not their job to conduct due diligence on a business. Okay, uh, it's my position that if an LOI is agreed upon and a buyer's that interested, they should have had enough information early to make a solid offer with with ninety percent of the material facts, if not one hundred percent. And what happens so often? These companies go to market with, or they entertain these conversations with just some financials, and there's no discussion about odor involvement, no discussion about client risk factors, no discussion about TPEs and their effects and no discussion about you know AR and collectibles and those sorts of things well all of that comes out post LOI and due diligence okay so my philosophy is if it's not the right buyer let's fail fast let's find out in two or three days not two or three months which is why I'm so thorough when I go into it that's just my approach i mean it's our job collectively to put businesses in the best light possible we also present them that way but if there's a strike against them, if there's a negative, a hiccup, a glitch, whatever you want to call it, let's let it be known right away. You're going to find this. This is what you're going to find in AR. There's, there's, there, let's say there are two owners or three owners with an owner, a, a couple and their son. And, you know, maybe there is some risk factors there. Well, let's get it on the table and talk about it day one, yeah. not 45 days later. The mental angst that gets created by that is amazing. Oh, yeah. And so... I think what you're talking about, though, to, to put a, a label to it is called retrading. Um, somebody agrees to a price, a buyer and a seller agree to a price, and then they start in on their quality of earnings. We call it a QE. And most of the time, it's a buy side QE. They hire forensic accounts and go through the financials in a tremendous amount of detail to prove that the financials are what we said they are. Okay. There's no more devastating. Um, a glitch that can occur when our numbers are different than their numbers. Yeah. Devastating. It changes the whole conversation. And so I go to great lengths to make sure that, that we're spot on. Okay. So the types of issues that come up in due diligence, first and foremost, is this QE. Okay. There are issues that arise. Are, are there, you know, do they need you, the owner, and what are they going to pay you? That may, very, that may be very different than what you're currently paying yourself. So there might be an adjustment for that. How about your spouse? Okay. Are you going to act in a lot of, uh, to a buyer's credit, a lot of PE firms and industry strategics will let the owners choose their career paths. If you're really good at building bridges and selling, go do that. That's where you're adding the most value. If you're a great operations guy, go do that. You know, keep, keep the train on the tracks. Yeah. If you're somewhere in between, do that. They don't want to fundamentally change who that seller is, okay? And so beyond the numbers, it can come down to personalities. It can come down to the owner involvement. That's key. You know, every owner wants to minimize their involvement in the business. They do. And they don't want to wear 15 hats, but a lot of them do. Yeah. And when they're talking to buyers, they portray the five hats that they're wearing and sort of ignore the 10 that they're not. Mm -hmm. And so a very common comment from a buyer is, we feel the seller's more involved than what they let on. Yeah. And oftentimes they're true. Yeah. So we can't, we can't sugarcoat some things because we need a comfortable buyer or we don't have a deal. So the numbers, the owner involvement, the client risk factors, the cyclicality, you know, we typically go, uh, we, let me say it this way. Every buyer will pull monthly reports for the last 24 months. They want to see month over month what's happening with sales and collections and where the cyclicality is. Okay. What was the one big job? A lot of times they'll pull P&Ls for specific projects. And so you had a $700,000 large loss or CAT event, you know, last October. Let's see the P&L on that. Yeah. Maybe that one project was 50% of their net for the year. Yeah. You think that changes the discussion? It absolutely does. Yeah. So, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. It can be uh, any number of variables, but does that help, Chris? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, the most no. common phrase, I mean, <laughs> not to be crude, but the most common phrase that we hear from clients when they're in that due diligence phase is they have crawled up my ass, all right? Yeah. I investigating yeah. and probing every possible very I mean and, and, That's right. and it, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it, it feels, feels that way. way. Yeah. Yeah. There are there are no secrets, believe me. Uh, my father was a veterinarian and as a kid I watched him strap on a rubber glove up to here and <laughs> you know insert that up to preg yeah. test cattle. And that's what it feels like. It is an invasive process. Yeah. Yeah. And believe me, it's unnerving when a buyer says, can you send me a CPA copy of your QuickBooks? Mm. You're lifting your skirt all the way up. Yeah. And believe me, they put four or five forensic accountants on it for a month. They will find every key number there is to find. There is no hiding. Yeah. And when they come back and start asking questions, you don't have to have answers on the spot, but you better be able to find them. Yeah, And this is where CPA to CPA communication comes in really handy. Yeah. Okay. And so um, if, but again, I'll circle back. If owners don't want to prepare for that kind of a discussion and their attitude is, well, we'll just address it when it comes up. It's a very dangerous place to be because a lot of those deals fall apart, not once, but twice or three times. And then they'll say, I'll just keep it. And they're they're probably never going to sell. They're the kind of people that can die at their desk. Yeah, they're going to be the uh, you know the inevitable baby boomer group right now. And I'm not dissing on mm -hmm. anybody. I'm just getting yeah. face full of this of these stats. The baby boomer generation right now is all on that precipice of absolutely right. having to sell their organizations. And for most of the blue collar. Uh, type service providers, which is probably, I don't know what the percentage is, but my gut says the average mom pa shop that, that feeds the bulk of our economy are not SaaS companies and big white collar outfits. That's right. And, and how interesting it is to know that how many of those business owners will get forced to exit and they're not going to either make money. Um, they may not even be able to sell. It, it may be mm -hmm. a, a giving up a closing of doors there's very few family members that are excited about taking on multi-generational mm -hmm. uh, businesses right now. There's just this massive wave um, that's creating a lot of buyer opportunity if you're interested in working hard and developing something like this. But that's there right. is a load of people that will be desperate and they are not going to sell. The stats, even outside of our industry, the business and analytics are all over this. And, and yeah. there's just a wave coming down of people that can't sell their business. So that being said, you know, one of the misconceptions that I had even meeting you early on in, in the days was, you know, how long do you really want to start talking to somebody before mm -hmm. they're ready to exit? And I was actually very surprised by the fact that you really want to get integrated in that conversation immediately, even if part of what you're telling somebody, just like you've already alluded to is, you, you probably don't want to sell for five years, three years, you know, six years, whatever right. the number is, but it's like estate planning almost. It's like go to Correct. work determining what you need to do before you're forced to, to do it. So if you don't mind, like, give us a better understanding, like give me a roadmap um, of what you would suggest somebody does, even if they've started the business today, how should they begin yeah. thinking about what they're doing in a relationship like yours, or maybe even with a team like us. Let me give you an example. I think it'll go a long way, not only for the two of you, but for listeners. Um, I like people to care about their business. And let me rephrase that. I need them to care about your business. And this is going to sound crude. If you as an owner don't care about your business in the road ahead, then why should I? Yeah. I can't make you care. Okay? Yeah. I can suggest, I can cajole, I can give you examples, I can tell you, kind of what you're in for and how bumpy the road is going to be. But if you don't take action, then I can't take action. Okay. Yeah. So some of the best conversations that I have are I'm five to eight years out, maybe even 10. I don't know where I stand. Let's go through this process for those who uh, are, are new to you or to me. I go through a process called evaluation and analysis, and it's pretty thorough. It lays out a lot of variables and gets really educated and they get to put on sort of their, their buying glasses and what, how buyers are going to view their business. Yeah. And I love modeling. Okay. Let's say I, I'll give you a real life example. I valued one of the nation's largest franchises and I won't uh, say who, but let's say they're doing 40 million a year. 
okay? And I put them, let's say, at a, at a 35 to $38 million value for this particular model. And he said, we're several years out yet, but now what should I be doing mm -hmm. to improve the value? Well, there was a, a short laundry list, we'll say, not a long one, but there was five or six things that they could do right away that could add seven to eight, nine, maybe $10 million in value. Then he came to me and said, our organic growth is about 14% a year. So now what would we be worth at the end of this year, the end of next year, and the end of 26? I love running those numbers. And it doesn't take long. Once the model is set up, I can easily go back and say, with your organic growth, here's what you're going to be worth the next three years. And better yet, they were talking about starting a new profit center and one more location. And if they did this profit center, and if they started this new location, here's the estimate of what you'll be worth then. Well, there was seven, another seven, eight, nine million dollars on top of that. Yeah. Well, now there's real tangible numbers. Yeah. And granted, it's hypothetical, but right. real tangible numbers based on a very predictable business. And they got back to me and said, great, we're going to work with our, our uh, CPA and our state planner. We're going to bring them in the loop on this, do some tax planning, and we'll be back in touch. And that was a last week conversation. It's perfect. Yeah. They are setting the stage for the road ahead so there's no surprises. And when there's tens of millions at stake, and I don't care how big the business is, maybe it's 500000 at stake for some people. It's a lot of money to those involved. Yeah. So plan accordingly, or you run the risk of not recovering that at all. So, you know, uh, one of the things I've kind of am, am leaning harder into, I guess, or kind of buying is this idea of, I, I think people are quick to assume they need a CPA relationship. I think mm -hmm. they're quick to determine they need an attorney relationship. And I think we falter on, and I think our ego kicks in. Of course, I'm biased because we're a consulting firm. Nobody needs to act as if we're not or whatever, right? Um, but they're not diligent in creating a relationship with a coach or a consultant, whatever that mm -hmm. looks like, smells like, I don't care. And they often don't start a conversation or a strategic partnership with a broker early. And I, mm -hmm. and I think the downside to that is, is that we, we assume, and it's funny cause we're just now starting our prep to begin doing our annual planning with our client book. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a topic of conversation and as powerful as the annual planning is. As powerful as doing a reboot on mission, vision, core values, where are we going? Why are mm -hmm. we going there? There, It is important and it's vitally, it's a vital part of the annual process. But I think what ends up inevitably happening is that we're not going the paces to actually create where we're headed, uh, literally looking at all the fundamental elements of our business. And so, you, you know, like I think the picture you painted was, if someone can begin modeling the enterprise value of their organization mm -hmm. from the very beginning, and they can look at that in a five-year time frame, they can backwards that, they can see it what it's going to be in a year based on estimate mm -hmm. projections, and they have this consistent outlook of this real data-driven number that mm -hmm. should be driving decisions today. Like, so if you did that. And you've gotten really clear with a broker and they've given you a very sound roadmap in terms of what are the things you have to have in place, rocking and rolling at full tilt, meaning separate your life from your business, right? Mm -hmm. If you got 400 grand in personal expenses in your company, maybe start building a plan to get those things out of the business or make sure they're isolated in such a way that they don't work against you. Like, I'm just thinking all of these things. Sure. Right. The consulting partnership where you start road mapping, if that's what you want in five or 10 years, what are you doing today to put it into place instead of waiting? Like, like, I feel like so many operations, they grind their faces off. We put in five, 10 years of really hard work. And what I feel like we do a lot of times is we've ignored the energy bleed that we put mm -hmm. into all these areas because we didn't want to pay a fee to have That's a right. relationship or a consulting relationship in our annual spend. But then I'm like, dude, whatever this annual fee is, is nowhere near what the to two commas are that are out on the horizon, let me, right? Like, let me give you an example. You're, you're spot on, Brandon. And, and let me give an example. Um, to me, consultants are like therapists. We all need one. We just don't realize it, right? I mean, most companies out there can benefit not a little bit, a lot 
yeah. by using a consultant. Yeah. And there's blind spots that we all have in our business. Yeah. And, and some people don't even know that there's blind spots because they don't even acknowledge them. Right. And when the floodlight guys come around and say, here's what we can work on, or when the exit strategy guys come around and say, hey, you want 10 million for your business or 30 million? Here's the four or five things you really need to do in the next five years. Yeah. But to be clear, none of us are on anyone's timing committee. I and I and I can't drive that point home enough. Mm. People think when they call me, I'm gonna push them to sell. Couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. Okay. It is always what's best for the client. The only time I've encouraged someone to sell, and I've had it happen maybe seven or eight times the last 15 years, is when I get a call from a hospital parking lot. Yeah. And they say, I met you three years ago, or I listened to this podcast mm. and I know who you are. I've been meaning to reach out. I just got some tough news get me the hell out of here and can you do it by Friday? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's where I jump into action quickly Yeah, and nobody wins in that situation. And so it's not about pushing anyone to sell. It's about being intentional and making an educated decision. Yeah. And that's what you're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. And I'll, I'll say it again. You've got to want those answers. Yeah. And if you don't, a consultant to myself, any advisor is going to be a complete waste of time. And that's unfortunate because this industry right now is really dynamic. And with this, with this squeeze happening, every percentage point, every margin you can bring to the bottom line, every addition to that margin is yeah. golden and it significantly affects value. You know, one of the, um, one of the things that came up today, we were having a conversation um, earlier uh, and with a serial entrepreneur and he made the comment that I've always believed in paying 25% more than I have to, to get two times the mm -hmm. result is essentially what mm -hmm. he summarized. And so basically what he was alluding to is that, look, I've, I've done the math. I've seen it through experience. Mm -hmm. I pay people more and I have less bad people. I have only mm -hmm. good people. And surprisingly enough, they do twice as much work. So I'm a net return of 75% on my, on my investment. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the other thing that we see uh, in this kind of relationship where we're hiring professionals to help us guide our decision making is that in the moment, it feels like we're, it's that decision we're making to spend 25% more. And yeah. we're getting though, that we have the opportunity to get two times the production out of our organization mm -hmm. for that spend. And so I just encourage people in that. And, and look, I'm not, I'm not saying any of this to pitch. We mm -hmm. have a consultant. And, and, you know, I likened it to this, like our team is, has kind of had some internal jokes about it is look, they're not going to do the job for us. And there are no, there are no silver bullets, but you know what they're going to mm -hmm. do is they're going to tell us which wall to hammer our head against so that all mm -hmm. the hammering that we do to put in the reps and do earn our stripes is yeah. on the fucking wall. And I that's think right. that's the opportunity for people to hire a, a brokerage, you know, a broker partner, someone that can guide them through this process to talk to guys like us or other restoration consultants, mm -hmm. as consultants is just make sure you're beating your head against the right damn wall. Then that way, you know, you're making forward progress, right? Because and when it comes to, don't, you know, yeah, I want to make one point in, and that is people call me and say, I'm struggling with this, you know, a consultant. And I'll say, yes, I know several. However, what are you struggling with? And they go into more detail and they'll say, yeah, I don't know that I can afford the 2,500 a month or the 3,000 a month, whatever it is. Okay. All, all the consultants are, a lot of them are different. And I'll say, you can't not afford to go down that road. You have to go down that road. You know, so that, so somebody spends 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year to solve a 200, 300, $400,000 a year problem. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You can't not go down that road and explore solutions. And that's come out of my mouth a lot the last year as, as the squeezes happened mm -hmm. and efficiency is uh, um, sort of the top of the heap when it comes to conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I think we got into this, but then we we've gotten a little uh, maybe a little bit trailed out. So, okay. You, you kind of hit at a high level, some of these core things to be considering in mm -hmm. terms of the business. Can we get a little bit more granular? Sure. Uh, you know, like let's get into the financials specifically, you know, I, I don't know why, but we've had a slew recently of conversations where we're begging people to invest time and energy in getting their books cleaned up and getting, mm -hmm. and I'm, I, I don't know how this happens. I'm I'm laughing because there's probably been times where I've allowed this to happen in businesses that we're associated with too. But 
somehow we're forgetting that prioritizing things like working financials are important. I don't know. Uh, but mm -hmm. let's hang in that pocket for a minute. I think there's a couple pocket subjects that we'll get in mm -hmm. on, but I want to hear some more detail from, from you in the financials. What are the, what are the foundational things that we need to be building out, preparing or leaning into so that we don't get blindsided with deductions later? The, well, I'll, let me start here. From 100,000 feet, the financial story and the numbers have to match the story that a buyer is being told. The verbal story, when they interview you, they interview a GM, they, and they spend several hours with you okay, before they really take a deep dive into the numbers, they have to, those stories have to match. And the problem is so many times they don't. Yeah. What owners think is just fine and normal in their world is not normal to a buyer. And that's where the disconnect happens. They'll say, well, I've been doing it this way for 35 years. That doesn't make it right. And I'm not saying they have to change, but we have to highlight some of those things. There's got to be a paper trail, you know, little things uh, like the, the mobile offices and the RV that so many restoration contractors have and the, the paying of the spouse, whether they work in the business or not, the personal vehicles, the 401ks, the all the ways we as business owners run money through our business. There's got to be clean, efficient paper trails. And what happens so often is those paper trails get really muddy. And they get muddy to the point where the owners don't even know where the funds are going. Okay, uh, here's an example. I'm working on a, about a $40 million facility services company in, in, in uh, Southern California right now. And there's so many different ad backs. There's a one example. There was a one-time lawsuit that involved a couple of employees. Well, there was a hundred twenty thousand dollar legal fee attached to that. This spanned three years. In one year, it was put into professional and legal. In another year, it was put into legal. In another year, it was put into administrative overhead. Mm. But when I started asking about the these funds and where they were, they couldn't even tell me. The controller had to go back and look. And ten days later, I got my answer. So those are the types of things that sound really simple on the surface, but they have to be figured out ahead of time mm -hmm. because we don't want a buyer coming back saying, oh, we've got your CPA copy. Here's where those funds were. You were wrong. It did. The story wasn't as you told me. Yeah. It's now what we're telling you. And I'll tell you, the egg on our face, uh, if that had happened, it'd be really something. Yeah. So sometimes sellers get a little frustrated that I have to get all these ducks in a row and make the financial story line up. But without that story lining up, we don't have a deal. So it's worth doing a little due diligence on our own ahead of time to make sure that, that our stories align. Because if they don't, the chances of a company selling are minimal, minimal to none. It, it, it seems like when those sorts of things happen, the biggest impact is it really erodes the blue sky value the brand value because mm -hmm. they start to put so much screw it's like oh well if they hid this or didn't understand this how many other problems are we likely to find and it just starts to erode the overall perceived value of the business is that exactly broken trust is the the biggest deal breaker that exists in my world it mm -hmm. and it's not Hey, we said, you know, this 2023 van had 19,000 miles on it. It really had 24,000 miles on it. We didn't update our records. That's immaterial in the scheme of things. Okay. It's, it's issues like the financial cleanliness and where dollars are placed. Um, I had a client years ago. Um, we were two weeks within the closing table. And he says, uh, by the way, JT, this is, I mean, we're definitive docs are almost done. He says, JT, um, they're going to make me the GM of this business. Um, I got to share something with you in private. I said, okay, what's going on? He said, I was in prison in the 80s for four years for securities fraud. And he said, do I need to disclose that? And I said, well, um, you are not a salesman. You're, you're not an ops manager. You're going to be the GM. They would do a background check on you, and they will do a background check on you. They're going to find this out. Yeah. So we need to disclose it. We disclosed it. The whole deal fell apart because we didn't disclose it early. Well, I found out about it. And about six hours later, we had brought the buyers into the loop. So there are things that can simply rip a deal apart. Yeah, there absolutely can. Um, but the the key is material changes. Hmm. 
and everyone defines material differently. And so um, when it comes to, I, I always challenge owners to say, if it's material to you, it's definitely material to them. And they're going to find 50 more, 50 more items that are material to them that aren't material to you. Yeah. So please follow my lead in saying, let's get our ducks in a row here. Yeah. Because without it, um, I get paid to sell them. Uh, you know, I get paid very little to put a company on the market and get to the closing table and fall apart, accept an offer and fall apart. It's a grind. It's an, it's emotional exhaustion to do that. Yeah. So I want to put that business in the best light possible. Yeah. And sometimes I get a little pushback on that. Yeah. And uh, if there's too much pushback and the ego start to to take hold, then I just part ways. It, it's not worth it. And that business will never sell, unfortunately. And I hate to be so black and white about that. But there's enough people who want to sell and want answers yeah. that I can't, I, I just can't try to convince people yeah. to do the right thing. Yeah. Mm. So just, uh, I think in an effort to, to kind of summarize some of these buckets, I got another one on, on point here. So on the financial side, it's a matter of, look, you have the freedom to run your business the way you're going to, right? Mm. That's, that's okay. But make sure that we're doing something proactively to be able to isolate, highlight, support, talk about in specifics what mm -hmm. that thing is and what role it has in a material manner at the close of, of a deal or when we begin negotiating a deal, right? Because I'm just thinking for all the entrepreneurs, a lot of us don't want to pay taxes on absolutely everything. We do a lot of things uh, in partnership with our CPAs to ensure that we're using expenses and leveraging those kinds of things in our favor. That right? RV parked in the warehouse. The, the RV. That's right. Bed, right. And and so we just got to have a way to unwrap that when it comes right. to be super transparent in the deal. So we're not mm -hmm. telling people don't use the business the way you created to use it. Correct. Be cognizant that you can unwrap that knot uh, when it's time so it doesn't work against you long term, right? That's right. The thing that I heard you highlighting is just the matter of we have to be telling a very clear and consistent story of what we're spending to produce the work, what we're spending to earn the work, right? What we're doing to to earn the revenue. There's just got to be crystal clarity. And and here's mm -hmm. the I would just hammer on this too is for some of you with larger business, this is really obvious. But for a lot of entrepreneurs, it, we just if there's cash in the bank, we're feeling pretty good about what we're doing. And, and the reality mm -hmm. of it is, is when our hair is on fire and we're doing the thing, it can be hard to slow down and prioritize these things that are very hard for you and I to create value around when they see a million dollars in their checking account. Like to right. them, they, they listen to what we're saying and they're kind of like, well, dude, yeah, it's, I don't fucking care. I got a million bucks. Like I know what's happening in my business. Okay. So I'm, I'm telling you then if you're ever going to exit that thing, uh, your checking account is not enough. And, and second of all, guess what else you can't do when you run everything out of your checking account is that you can't compel people to be accountable to their performance or help lead your organization because you wouldn't be able to tell them how they're performing anyways. Because at the end of the day, our number one measurement device is the financials of our institution is what tells us if we're performing or not performing. And so yeah. you didn't say it exactly like that, but... You know. No, that was that was very well said. And the only thing I'll add to that is between the three of us, we have to help owners understand their numbers. When mm -hmm. I come along and say last year your margins were up, you know, let's say your your cost of goods margins uh, were up, uh, we'll say higher by three and a half percent, and this year they're up another two and a half percent. And I look at them and say, why are your cost of goods margins higher, six percent higher now than they were in twenty three or twenty two? Yeah. And when they shrug their shoulders and go, oh, I had no idea. That's not a good answer. Yeah. You know, 20 out of 20 buyers are going to ask that question and 15 more just like it to, to drill deeper into, into the reason why. Yeah. You've got to understand what's happening with your numbers. Yeah. And so between consultants and someone like me, um, we help prep you for those conversations that are coming. And in the meantime, we help you get a... a, a you know, exit ready business that's well run that in theory you can enjoy for a few years uh, and be strategic in before you sell. Yeah, maybe you change your mind, right? You know, to hang on that cost of goods and uh, just general overhead and so forth, these these single digit percentage points, you and I talked about this mm -hmm. little uh, uh, training module we were creating around this subject. And 
And I thought we we probably don't talk to people enough about this, right? The mm-hmm. this idea of cost of goods, consumables, pricing going up mm-hmm. and so forth is that I think a lot of business owners as they're growing, they they start to lose track of those details and those details mm-hmm. hold a lot of value, right? You think about a $3 million business, if your cost of goods goes up by three and a half, four and a half, five, six percent over a period of mm-hmm. time, that's a big number that, that's, that's right. going into your pocket that's not dropping to the bottom line. I mean, we think in this in this industry, right? Most people sort of the the benchmark that most people are working towards uh, in terms of EBITDA uh, figures. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody argues about this, but let's just say 15 to 25%, right? Should be that mm-hmm. bottom line number. Well, if you've got, if your cost of goods has gone up three and a half percent, that's a huge impact on that, on that net figure that you're growing right. towards, right? And and, and and it gets worse, Chris. I mean, it, oh, sure. then you put a multiple on top of that. Oh, man. Let's say, yeah. let's say you're uh, doing 10 million and you're three and a half percent off. So that's three and a half percent, three hundred fifty thousand yeah. that should be on the bottom line that isn't. Now hit that with a multiple of six, let's yeah. say. Uh, yeah. Well, there's two million dollars or thereabouts that should be in value yeah. that is not there because of that three yeah. percent, that three and a half percent. And yeah. so when an owner sees that two million dollars of value is missing because their cost of goods is up three and a half percent. Yeah. You can see that light bulb go on. And yeah. I've challenged many owners to say, if you fix this, there's another $3 million in your pocket. And it's like, they can't get off the phone fast enough to go find that answer. And I love that. It's huge. Because, I, yeah, I, yeah. Go ahead. I love that too. And I think you yeah. have up a really awesome point, which we probably don't talk about enough. And I think it's it's worth our, even even our team reminding ourselves and, and, and bringing this up to our clients is, where do you find that three and a half percent? How do you deal with three percent? Right. You know, cost of goods. You know, increase is well. I think oftentimes during our growth, we forget about our buying power. That's right. If, if three years ago we were at one and a half million and we're buying, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand of goods from this particular supplier, well, now three years later we're buying eight hundred thousand dollars worth of goods That's from right. the supplier. We've got leverage. Yeah. And so oftentimes you remarked on this that. Sometimes that three and a half percent gap can be closed in a period of weeks or months simply by going back right. to the and saying, "Hey, shit, we're doing, we're doing five x the business that that now with you that we were doing two years ago. We want to optimize discount. pricing, and we're going to go shop this out. And that three and a half percent gap might be closed in a period of weeks. Yeah, yeah. And if you ask most business owners, can they bring another two and a half, three, three and a half, four percent to the bottom line if they watch their P's and Q's? 99 out of 100 will say, yes, I can do that. Yeah. Well, guess what? Now's a good time to do it. Yeah. You know, when they see it attached to value, uh, enterprise value, it's a great time to sharpen the pencil and get it to the bottom line. Yeah. All right. Another bucket, yeah. guys, because I feel like if we don't get into this bucket, we're we're doing a disservice. Um, okay. I think many, many companies, and we harp on this, obviously, um, and, and again, we've not done this well all the years. Like we had pockets where we were killing it and we've had plenty of pockets where we were falling on our face. And mm-hmm. what I'm talking about is systems process. Okay. So yeah. a lot of organizations, they are way over dependent on owners and, mm-hmm. and a handful of key leaders, let's call it. Right. Um, and this is true for big organizations and small organizations. It is universal uh, in who it yeah. is. Right. And it's this, we get swept up in this cycle of it's just faster to do it myself. And then we mirror Mm -hmm. that for the one, two, three people in our team that we trust enough to hand responsibility to. And then they begin Mm -hmm. acting the same way. And so now we've got department heads and GMs and finance directors that are quick to jump in and become part of the production cycle because in quotes, it's faster uh, than training, equipping, or building a system and a process. The other thing that we see firsthand is it is grueling to work on process when your business is already left the shipyard. It's Mm -hmm. grueling. And we think that we're going to come to an experience and start dedicating 60, 70, 80% of our time of quotes working on the business. That ain't fucking reality. And so one of the things that we've been talking to teams about 
is this idea of, look, be honest with how much bandwidth you have to give to strategy. If it's 10%, mm -hmm. when we create a roadmap of strategic initiatives in your business, you need to remind yourself that only 10% of your time is going to even be levied at these initiatives. But man, mm -hmm. if I started giving the 10% today, by the end of the year, maybe it's now 15% I can give. Mm -hmm. And by the following year after that, maybe I'm up to 20, 30% of my time that goes to this. And if I do that over five years, I have an exit ready business and I get the valuation that I want when I leave. And so I think we just, I get frustrated when I'm trying to get business owners to commit to giving mm -hmm. some version of time and commitment to systems and processes. And it is like, uh, anyways, I'm going to start crying and whining to myself. Whoa, is me. It's just, it's crazy how hard it is yeah. to get people doing well, that time and energy into this. But what did we, what did we hear for years, right? Especially before the interest rates went up and the industry was on fire. I can't find good help. Can't yeah. find good help. Nobody wants to work as hard as me. Well, guess what? You're the owner. Yeah. You know, someone's making 25 bucks an hour. They're not expected to work as hard as you yeah. as an owner. They're just not. Mm. Okay. Um, I have the exact same discussions, Brandon, and and all I get into delegation. Yeah. And I have drawn a line, not to sound cold, but I've drawn a line between can't find good help, effective leadership, effective delegation. Because what, what I'm being told is I can't find good help. Well, sometimes that translates into you're not delegating very well. And I've heard people say, well, I've told them how to do it. I can delegate. Well, there's a lot more to delegation than telling somebody how to do something. Yeah. Okay? And it that's frustrating for me. Yeah. Just the ability of an owner to trust their team is big. It's really big. And there should be consultants should have whole profit centers around trusting their team and developing that trust. Because if they can do that and learn how to replicate themselves, I've said for decades, the hardest location is the second one. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you, at the second one, you've got to learn how to replicate yourself. Three, four, five, and six are easier. Yeah. Because now you've had to trust your team. Yeah. If you can delegate and trust a team, growth is unlimited. Yeah. It, it absolutely is. But yeah. to get there, it, it messes with people. It really does. Yeah. And, but from your experience, I mean, you know, that whole kind of uh, from LOI to real, real cash in a check, yeah. uh, you know, you, you had mentioned a lot that the integration or the level of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of the owners playing in terms of production and contributing to the business obviously play, plays a big role, but where, like, give us some examples of where this comes to light, where it's like, nope, that person has not spent the time to create systems and processes and learn mm -hmm. how to build leaders. The business operates on their back. What happened? Like, what kind of, do you have a story that you could share with us at the finish line where it's just like, wow, that's a disappointment. There's uh yeah, and I alluded to it earlier. Fair question, Brandon. When you're in a smaller business, let's say sub five million in enterprise value, and it's an SBA type deal, that owner's likely wearing 10, 15, 18 hats. Yeah. Okay. What the buyers heard throughout the month or two leading up to an LOI is that that seller's wearing eight hats, 10 hats, not 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. And in due diligence, it comes out and usually confirms their suspicions that they're wearing a lot more. Then the question is, is that individual replaceable? Can, what does the business look like without that individual or without their spouse? A lot of successful restoration companies out there with not to stereotype, but he running production and operations, she running all things office and collections, very effective teams, right? Everybody's looking out for the money, um, owners handling a lot of the uh, the bulk of, of material communication. And what does the business look like when those two people or one key person is pulled out of the business? Yeah. Instantly, it's high risk. Yeah. Okay? So you've got to be able to minimize the hats that you're wearing. Now, as the businesses grow, let's say you're 8, 10, 12 million and up. And those buyers, whether you're an industry strategic or a uh, you, you can do a large SBA deal up to about 8 million with some bridge financing, et cetera. But let's say it's PE or industry strategics and it's eight, 9 million and up. Chances are you're going to roll a little equity. Chances are you're not going to retire at the closing table. You're going to put in a year or two or three as mentioned. And if you're wearing 15 hats, you're going to continue to wear 15 hats for a while. Now yeah. back office is going to pull some things off your plate. They're going to pull some reporting and some KPIs and 
some or all of the accounting. There's things that that the back office from a, a buyer can they'll make your life a lot easier. They really do because they want you to focus on what you're good at and where you can add value. Yeah. So the larger the business, it's not as critical. The smaller the business, it's it's highly critical. Mm-hmm. And one, and I think I mentioned this to one of you over the last year, one of the things that nobody looks at is the tenure of your team. Oh. Okay. I always ask, how many key employees are there? Let's say it's a company doing 10 million, you're throwing off a million five, two million, nice company. And let's talk about the tenure of your team. And let's say you've got five or six key employees. What is their average industry experience? And how many years have they been with you at your company? Well, here's two ends of the spectrum. What if the average industry experience is 15 years, but the average tenure with you is 18 months? Yeah. Sounds risky. Yeah. That's not great. Okay. Yeah. What if the industry experience is 18 or 20 years, but they've been with you on average 10 or 12 years? What might that say about their level of leadership, their pay structure, their management philosophy, their ability or not to micromanage their career paths? You get that 10 year crunch to one or two or three years. It opens up a myriad of questions about how that owner works and buyers dig deep into why that tenure is so short. And it, that, that conversation never happens. And as consultants, you, you need to be having that, not to tell you how to make sausage in your factory, but when you're talking to owners, you've got to be able to have that conversation uh, and it may lead to to pay structures and incentives and compensation plans and and the culture and career paths and uncomfortable conversations that these owners need to have yeah. because up to that point it might just be now oh, we're going to let so and so go it's easier to do that than rebuild what we're doing yeah no but I, as a buyer I need that tenure there yeah it, uh, it's so interesting that you said that because again like pointing back to a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago with Rocky Hensley from One Tom. He was, yeah. just, again, alluding to that pay scale. Like, he's not afraid yeah. to pay more than what the competitors are. That's right. He They do a thing where around their shop, they have a jersey for five years and longer. Being employed with the mm-hmm. company, you'll get a jersey with your name on it and the things. And then yeah. I think there's five, ten, if it, there's a series of these jerseys that you get, right? And he's got, he said, of, of a staff of 47, 26 or 27 folks have a jersey on the wall. And that's so, awesome. It's yeah. awesome, right? And so what's interesting, yeah. think about this combo. He pays 20 to 25% more than his competitors. Mm-hmm. They tow a very hard line against standards. Non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. They fire you if you miss one, uh, two uh, on-call calls. Yeah. He's had to let somebody go that was there nearly six years. Wow. They tow the line. They pay yeah. more. And yet their tenure and their culture and their profit margin is higher than the average bear yeah. across all measurables in their organization. So like yeah. to me, and, and guess what? Uh, he doesn't need to sell icon anytime soon. Right. He has zero stress. He said uh, he right. the fact that he often will take two to three months off a year where he's gone mm-hmm. out of the business. And yet all these successes are happening in the organization. What, well, you know, Ultimately, what we're talking about right now is building an exit ready business. Right. Those are the funnest to run. And I think in a lot of ways, he's showing that when you do it, it actually you win across the board. If he wanted to sell right. icon tomorrow, he could. They're not going to negotiate him down because his business does not need him. There are systems, process, measurables, tenure. Yep. He's got all the boxes checked, man. And so whether he keeps it or sells it, he wins either way. Like I think the message that I want people to hear in our, in our talk is exit ready businesses is the playbook. It does not matter if you sell tomorrow or not. It's just fucking more fun to own one period. It gives you a quality of life and a balance that you can't get any other way. Yeah. And I I've had 40 year olds call me and say, I've been in this business for 10 years. I don't recognize it anymore. I need out. Mm. And I'll say, listen, it's throwing off 500, 800,000, a million dollars a year to you. What if we reduced your stress? Yeah. Got you back down to 35, 40 hours a week instead of 70. Would you keep it? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love right. to do that. Yeah. They just don't know how. Yeah. So sometimes selling is is not the only option. Let's get you cleaned up and get your sanity back. Then make a decision 
without all the emotion. I mean, it, you know, emotions, they, they make great consultants and bad decision makers, you know, so let's, <laughs> let's keep emotion. Uh, let's keep uh, where they belong, but don't, yeah. don't let them make key decisions for you. Dude, I, I love it. Um, I think that's a, a great place to wrap. I think that we had a chance to kind of get into some of the nitty gritty that I think not everyone's been talking about and or mm -hmm. just serves as a great, you know, reminder for the things that are most important for us to, to spend our time and energy on. Um, JT, obviously, uh, we appreciate you being a guest on the show. If we're directing somebody to then go out and add that third you know, tool in the toolkit in terms of, of strategic partners, where do we send them to begin working with you to establish a, a plan and a program around being exit ready in terms of the, you give them the advice on what, what they need to do, man, where are we sending folks? Well, the first step is, is my cell phone or website and a confidential conversation. You know, people will reach out and they've, uh, some people don't even know where to begin. They'll yeah. say, I've never done this before. What should I be asking? Just start talking. Those are great conversations. I, I love those. So a uh, confidential conversation goes a long ways. And it's no pressure. Uh, I've said it once. I'll say it again. It's just an education. You know, I want to give you the tools. You want to give them the tools to make good decisions. That's all we're doing here. Yeah. And, and everybody wins in the end. So best way to reach out to you, um, I'm going to assume DM on LinkedIn, right? You're, you're rocking and rolling yep. on LinkedIn. Um, yep. And then website. Uh, where uh, are we them? Exit Strategies 360. It's Exit Strategies, the words, and then the digits 360.com. And uh, the cell phone, which you can pass along to people, that's all confidential. I'm a one horse show. Everything, there's no no one else in my office. So it always comes to me. Everything in my world is 100% confidential, and we keep it that way. That's good. Well, we'll add your contact info into the show notes for those that listened and want to start adding that. Uh, into the toolkit and building a relationship. And then of course, guys, you know what we do. Uh, we're, we're the counterpart to what JT's describing. So if you want a battle buddy in the trench, you want an accountability partner to help you build the things out to make your business exit ready and give you all the options at the end of the day, um, that's what our team's here uh, to do. So thanks for hanging with us. JT, thanks. All right. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, Brandon. And thanks, Chris. Take care.